Hi, this is Silver and Camille with Two Not Two Black Moms. We're back with our couples coffee chat. We're excited to be discussing parenting discipline and the differences we see in different cultures, different generations, and things like that. This is a totally candid, based on our personal experiences, um, our opinions, a little bit of our faith is thrown in here. Just a totally unedited, candid conversation about different discipline and parenting styles and things like that. We hope that you enjoy this conversation. We did have some technical difficulties at the end, but we'll be sure to add those into our next parenting session. We hope you enjoyed this and please leave us uh, some questions and comments. We'd love to hear from you guys about you know, what kind of discipline did you guys experience and what worked for you? What didn't work for you? What changes have you made? What changes do you hope to make? Um, again, we're here to just discuss parenting and we're so thankful that you guys are joining us today. No, you're not alone as a tiger mom either. You know, my kids, uh, them and their classmates call me psycho because... No way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're like, oh. Psycho Lady or Savage is my other nickname. I am probably the least like strict parent here in some areas. But that's mostly like, again, like I kind of I have these little blonde children and I'm not worried about them. But I do balance it out because I also don't want them to be the stereotypical like annoying frat boys. Like that's my <laughs> fear because they some of them already act like that. <laughs> Which, because it's just like they just have that like boy expectation like attitude I guess <laughs> like we were actually making fun of my uh like PJ staying with us and we were making he was like boy you have no idea how spoiled you are because he was comp we were having a chat about the one time I think I told you this Camille um about the one time where he was like I don't eat cold food <laughs> and we're like <laughs> I was like, well, then I guess you're not eating because we got hoagies, so, which I was yeah. like, where did you even get that from? <laughs> like, <laughs> I've never done, like, the short order cook, like, whatever I cook is what's for dinner type of thing, but, like, that just, like, naturally came, and we were like, what? So, well, we're I calling guess. this the year of being humbled. I, I, I guess. Getting that uh, taste of the free lunch stuff and <laughs> all of that. And that. Uh, I guess we'd had to find out what is too strict or or what's too strict and what is because you said you might be the least strict mm -hmm. and I guess we need to define what is too strict or what is even strict period. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's right, which may vary by out. culture. I think it, in a lot of circles I'm probably like like in some areas of my parenting I'm probably really strict like my kids are I'm big on chores and responsibility and independence and all of those things um but I'm not great at like demanding respect um mostly because I just get tired and I give up which is not <laughs> a good thing um <laughs> And Ed looks at me like, are you serious? My, I would have never been allowed to do that. Or PJ's like, he actually picked up Noelle and carried her upstairs for me today. <laughs> Which then she's just looking like, what is happening? Well, um, she's, uh, she definitely is one that like will push. And I feel like that's a youngest child thing. But like the time that I took her to ballet. And so at first she was like, doing everything I said and it wasn't a big deal but then it was like oh let me test and see and so when I put her in the car she's like my daddy said I don't have to wear my seatbelt and I was like well in Miss Camille's car you have to wear your seatbelt or we're not going anywhere and so I started driving and she took it off and she was like so I pulled over and I was like oh not going to dance class and so she said I'm like listen I'm not moving until you put it back on and I am stubborn mm -hmm. and I'm always like so, and even with my own kids, like when Benji was little and he wouldn't get into the car, so he was a baby. And I was like, I'm going to win. Mm -hmm. I'm going to win. And you're just yeah. going to, and that's yeah. it. But that's and a so safety thing. Like that is one of those areas where I feel like I don't care how strict a parent gets because it is better to be strict than your kid to be harmed. That's true. But it's you like know, the thing though, like yeah. the kids know, like even when I go to the school and all the kids are like, oh, we got to sit down and be quiet because here she comes because I don't mind gathering any children that are that need to be gathered because I'm like you're kids and you need to be you need to be respectful and you need to act like a kid like I'm not arguing with a child but see my, my thing is 
what's strict and what's just good parenting. So mm -hmm. I have this, I have this thing, and I love to say it. Um, you never, ever, ever, ever hear anyone say, "Oh, they're just too disciplined." Oh, I'm, I'm sick of them. They just, they just so respectful. You never, ever hear that at all. You only hear good things about the people that are disciplined and are respectful. You only hear good things about them. So it's a matter of what is strict and what is just really good parenting. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes you can't, as a parent, you can't necessarily always be concerned about the tears that these children cry because the reality is, we already reached the other side. We know what it's like to go through the transition from child to adult and all the things that you could face. Forget the culture you come from. Forget, you know, what, what background, what color you are, anything of the sort. We know the transition from child to adult and all the things that can come with it. So it's our job to prepare them. Um, and so that's, you know, it, 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 it can, if sometimes it feel like it could be a fine line but at the same time, it's like, what is strict and what is just parenting? I feel like for me, one of the things that I've always struggled with is um, I really, I want my kids to always be respectful. And from what I've seen, they are very respectful with others, except for <laughs> the little girl. We're still working on that one, but she's doing better. Um, she was also two at that time. So, or, you yeah. know, something like that. Anyway, um, but it's like. I want it to be that order so they're prepared, like you're saying, where they, where other people are like, oh, that person's very, res you know, respectful and they're very, you know, disciplined and stuff like that. And then that balance of, but I don't want to be that unnecessarily strict in areas mm -hmm. that aren't necessary because even if my kid goes down the perfect path and they get like the perfect career and they do this, but they don't want to come home for Thanksgiving dinner because they don't mm -hmm. want a relationship with me, did I, was I successful? Mm. you know it's, it's definitely point. a fine balance because i mean there are times where kids are gonna everybody has their own perspective of a situation so there are going to be situations where you know you could parent two kids very similarly and one of them could see it very negative experience and one of them could see it as a positive experience and we're all just kind of winging it a little bit mm -hmm. um but overall my goal is like i want them to be prepared for the world but i still want them to come want to come home for thanksgiving well and also too um I feel like it all, it, it all depends on the, the nature that you're doing it out of or the spirit that you're doing it out of. Like, I am really big on explaining and character building. Mm -hmm. So I'll say, you know, when you do that, it makes me feel this way. Or when you do this, this is the end result. Or this is why it's not okay for you to do this. Like lying. And it could be something very simple. And I'm like, well when you get older, you're going to want to go out and hang out with your friends. But if you're lying to me right now, I can't trust that when I, if I let you go, that you're going to be doing what I said. So I'm trying to build integrity, you know, whereas maybe in our generation growing up, it was, we didn't get the explanation. It was just no. And maybe you got hit or, you know, <laughs> or you got punished or whatever, you know? And it's like, so I, <laughs> I do think that there needs to be a balance of that. Mm -hmm. And, um, because serial killers are the best rule followers ever. Follow all the rules and do everything to the T according to what they've been told to do. But inwardly, there's still a lot of ugliness and bad character because it wasn't explained like, this is why this is happening. This is your consequence for that. Mm -hmm. um, and so it there are some things that, you know, and I like, that's why I said it's relative. There's some things that for us are non-negotiables, like the way that you answer an adult, um, the way that you talk to us, the way that you talk to each other, how you behave in school. Like the boys know we better not get a phone call that you've been disrespectful to at school because then it's going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and that too comes from like, I know my grandmother used to say, you want to raise your kids in a way that other people want to deal with them. Mm. That they want to be bothered that's a with. really good thing because I know like <laughs> I don't want to sound bad my kids are by no means perfect but I remember my thing was always like I don't want them to be written off for irritating <laughs> like inherently <laughs> irritating or bratty behavior kid behavior fine like I get it kids 
you know, are going to be kids sometimes. But I mean, just the general idea that they could be around a group of people and not like kind of knowing their place a little bit. I don't know mm -hmm. if like of a better word, but like, you know, you've got the kids table at the holiday dinner and the adult table and not that they can't interact, but just the idea of being respectful to the adults around them. You know, um, again, not like hard, fast rules. We're pretty like, we're like a fairly relaxed group, but I think it's okay to respond like, hey, the adults are talking right now. Why don't you go do this if you don't need me? Or at least like with Noel right now, the big thing is, excuse me. You know, she does test. She's very rude at first. And then she'll go right from like that horrible rudeness to, excuse me, daddy. <laughs> like, so she's, you know, we're good there. But just that idea of, you know, that other people will want to deal with them. You don't want them to be the mm -hmm. kid that people write off because in some sense, then it's not even fair to the kid because kids right. have to be kind of guided. And if you're not giving them any guidance and then they kind of go into school and they're the kid who gets labeled as the bad kid and or the difficult kid, like you almost set them up to fail because then it's like, not only do they not have the skills to be respectful, then they kind of becomes this like self-fulfilled prophecy because they're like, oh, I'm the bad kid, you know, and then it's just like snowballs from there and nobody wants to deal with them. Well, uh, Jane, you were talking about being a tiger mom. Do you want to like expound on that a little bit? Yeah, you guys mentioned discipline, and I, like, just wanted to hide under my blanket and be like, this part, I just want to, like, just shield. I don't know. I used to, um, like, I used to resent Asian stereotypes. I didn't even know the phrase tiger mom, like, at all. I didn't, like, I think Drew had to tell me what it was, like, a couple years ago. Like, I didn't, I was like, what's that? And he's like, really? <laughs> and he just, like, looked at me, and he's like, you. And I was like, what the, what's that? <laughs> you know like what there's like um I don't know and so like and I always do this I like resent almost all Asian stereotypes and then I'm like oh I think I hear resent them because that's probably like closer to me than I'd like to admit you know um <laughs> but there's a lot of um I don't know I grew up definitely being disciplined with a stick um not like literally a stick the wooden spoon um, but it was, uh, it was like definitely a process. It wasn't it ever in anger. Um, like I was sent to another room to go think about what I did wrong. And then, um, I would get, we would talk about why it was wrong. I remember this so clearly because <laughs> it happened a lot. So we'd have to talk about why it was wrong. I'd have to apologize. I got spanked and then I got hugged to like, you know, like bring it back, you know, bring it back together. Um, but it was a lot like and it was only me because I was the one that really needed it my sisters did not really need to be disciplined as much as I needed to be and <laughs> like we had family members kind of like pull my parents aside being like don't you think you pick on Jane a little bit too much or you know like because they thought it was crossing that line of too strict but honestly as me as a parent now and as an adult now like I really needed it and if I really am honest with myself I was never um I never really got broken. Like, I'm still extremely disrespectful in my heart, and I'm still extremely rude with my parents. Um, and, and they just tried the best that they could, and we got through it, and I was 18 and moved out, and, and, and we, we all kind of like each other now. <laughs> still. Um, but, but when I think about, like, discipline for me as a mom, it's really hard, too, because um, we have two cultures here going on too. And like your mom is so, I feel like your mom is so different than my mom. Um, even in her approach, like things that I think, uh, what do I, I feel like um, she like manipulates to get compliance. Like she tries to turn things into games to get compliance. And I'm like, no, like they need to listen right away. Like cut that off. Mm -hmm. There's no game playing here. She disobeyed. She's out. Like we're not going, then we don't go to the beach, you know, or we don't, we're turn the car around. We're Are gonna you just crying about it? Good. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, <laughs> something better to cry about because seriously, um, I don't know. I get, I don't know. I do feel like I am a tiger mom at times. I definitely um, want to say, like when I talk to other people about parenting, uh, do as I say, not as I do, for sure. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. it is like a deep-rooted value that we have never to discipline in anger 
Mm-hmm. You know, okay. like not even like the let me cut into you with my words kind of like like you right. guys as a parent take time to cool off and then like talk to them. Um, John is very, I, I believe, John, that you are gifted in um, disciplining with the word of God. Like, you know, like he'll go straight to this is why we don't do this. Like, let's open up the Bible and like see like, you know, we want to honor Jesus. And it's because like he's done this for us that we want to um, do this for him. It's not like a guilt thing. It's not a um, like you, like Camille was saying about building character. You want to tell the why. And why do we do these things? And that there's no um, shame for the Christian, and there's no, and there's always like a way back um, mm-hmm. from it. And so there's it's always edifying. Off, yeah. Whereas I, because I grew up with it, like I go more shame route than I even recognize. <laughs> and he has to call me out, you know, on it. Come on, John, get the rod. <laughs> <laughs> oh. This is- it's gotten. <laughs> what do you think? My uh, my grandparents. My, my grandfather was a pastor, and oh, uh, wow. he used to have a, a favorite switch, and uh, he he actually uh, either labeled it or or just named it. He named it. I need the every hour. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, but uh, yeah, I don't, J- Jane like comes out of you know, uh, she, like being out of, out of Asian cultures. It's interesting, but she's she's much more Americanized than like prior generations mm-hmm. in that way too. So it's not it's not as sharp as maybe it sounds. Um, but there is in parts of her family and extended family, like you can see like um, kind of like a shame culture mm-hmm. or just a performance, performance-based, performance mm-hmm. um, very keyed in on um, outward markers of success um, and, and feelings of inadequacy when those don't yeah. materialize with ease. And saving face to the public, like at least look like you've got it together. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I like, I don't tend to chafe at that very much in, in one sense and that I'm a perfectionist, right? So um, it's kind of like I naturally fall into those kind of trends too. Um, but the thing I find I really got to watch out for is um, wanting to discipline my kids because I feel like they've reflected poorly on me mm-hmm. and how I might be perceived. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that's really dangerous um, because it comes out of the wrong motive. Uh, and mm-hmm. because in truth, my kids aren't a reflection on me. But I mean, it's not always perceived that way. We all struggle with that, I'm sure, in terms of oh, yeah. uh, wanting, you know, the, the public view to be disciplined and in order and respectful, just like you're saying, because you're absolutely right. Like, you, no one ever said, I, I didn't like that guy. He was too respectful. <laughs> like, I'm going to write that one just, down. You know, no, one, no one ever said it, you know. So it's, 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 it's how do we draw that out of the kids without using shame? Um, using the proper motive, tying it back to, to, to reasons why and elements of good character and biblical truth. Um, why should you have these things, do these things? It's a hard balance. I also, like, um, personally kind of struggle in a sense of um, being reactive in discipline and not taking that five minutes to cool back off before I go to, like, figure out the punishment and administer discipline. Um, and so it'll come out either verbally or... Um, or like that will have to be like you know they'll have to be like you know hey um, hold up you know take a second breathe yeah I definitely put the mom bar in front of him yeah because many gonna, a time you know, like let's take a second yeah you, you, you <laughs> before you go address that um, but you know I think a lot of it depends on the the, the kid too um, mm-hmm. our oldest is is a little strong willed um, and persistent so. Yeah. She she met she got the excuse me yeah yeah she got the excuse me down but but she still hasn't figured out the context right so you're on a business call you're in a very like intense adult conversation just between husband and wife in terms of like figuring out plans setting policy right moment by moment stuff and it's it's like excuse me daddy excuse me daddy and you're like right. okay not now like adults are talking <laughs> like right, right. go <laughs> do something Shut it. um 
but and sometimes it's just really hard to shut her down and she'll just keep at it and uh and she'll get really really persistent and really ramped up and then when you shut it down then she gets so hurt and it's so demoralizing so again like we know where we want to be and who we want to be but i mean our parenting game is <laughs> i mean our covid parenting game especially is terrible right now we're all winging it we're all think- in like I think they, there was one thing that I kind of joked about with somebody. I can't remember. But there was, like, this meme going around where it's, like, boomers, shh, did you hear she went to therapy? And then it's, like, millennials and Gen Z, Generation Z are, like, yo, guess what my therapist said? So, like, I feel like at least with this, like, shift in that, we can be, like, listen, kids, we're not perfect. We need Jesus. We are going to fail at this. Um, I'll pay for your therapy later if we need it. Like, <laughs> you know, kind of, I, and honestly, I think that might be some of the difference because I don't know how everybody else grew up, but I grew up with this picture that like, I had to be good because, um, my mom was perfect. And this idea that the parent was perfect and they don't apologize. They're not wrong. They're always right. And if they are wrong, we kind of sweep it under the rug. We don't acknowledge a mistake. Um, the shame thing was huge. And so um, one of the things that I've been really big on is when I do overstep or, or if I, sometimes it's not that, you know, they did deserve to get in trouble, but maybe I overreacted in how I delivered the punishment. Like I might've been screaming at them instead of having that conversation. Um, mm-hmm or being reactive versus taking that minute to cool down. So I explained to them, like, they were still wrong. Their behavior was still wrong. But I also didn't respond correctly. And I need to, you know, and kind of that way of, like, still commanding, like, I'm still the adult here. You still Mm -hmm. did something wrong. Your punishment, you know, you still get a consequence for your behavior. But as an adult, I'm still human. I'm not perfect. And I'm going to make mistakes sometimes too, you know, and kind of giving that like realistic human nature to parents, um, I think can be helpful and modeling to them like, hey, I make mistakes too. And it's okay to make mistakes, but we have to try really hard next time to do better because an apology without a changed behavior doesn't mean a lot, you know, so I try to kind of model that and explain, I mean, I, (laughs) <laughs> I'm not perfect at the parenting thing. Um, and I'm really good at teaching parenting classes and writing about parenting. Um, but the actual application in my own life, because there's all these external factors of not getting enough sleep or maybe forgetting to eat or COVID parenting or like all of these compounding, like a stressful day at work, like all of these variables are kind of thrown in. Um, but I think, John, you made a really good point when you're like, am I upset because of you know, how I want them to be perceived, or did they actually do something that requires um, a response and a consequence? Or is it just me having an issue? So sometimes I think that also translates to, did I just have a bad day? And is their behavior irritating me because I'm tired? Or is it irritating me because they're wrong? Mm -hmm. And I struggle with that. Um, I've learned, like, headphones are my friends. I've learned, like, you know, Space is helpful sometimes. Um, things like that. I think it's just like a work in progress. But I feel like our generation, whether we over-discipline, under-discipline, all of those other things, at least we have the advantage of we're like, hey, we don't know what we're doing all the time. So, like, here's a professional if you need to work this out versus the idea that, like, we have to be perfect parents or we know exactly what we're doing or that whole, like, saving face thing of um i remember like there was a i am so glad social media was not a thing when we were kids because i feel like i would have the parent who would have laid out everything that i ever did wrong for like the world to see in an attempt to like make me do better (laughs) like that's how i would like honestly think that that's how that would have gone um and i really was a fairly i was noelish without being hyperactive as like a little kid um but I was a pretty like chill child but um my brother was not and um yeah I just get the impression that there would have been a lot of public shaming so I'm thankful that we did not have (laughs) the internet for that um but I think that like shame and public perception is something that I feel like 
our generation has gotten better at, um, regardless of culture. I mean, I think it's probably stronger in some cultures, but I feel like we've made advancements, I think, like, our generation in the whole, like, we're not perfect. Like, I feel like we had that advantage of, like, social media started coming on while we were parents, but, like, and there was that initial, like, oh, my gosh, I got to keep up and do what everyone else is doing, and then we all kind of hit that psh- it's all a joke. Like the more yeah. I worked online, the more that I realized everyone is faking it. Everyone that publishes stuff online <laughs> of like the perfect pictures and all of that, faking it. Cause I've done pictures and like my background is probably, yeah, not pretty, you, well, know? you know? And I've also convinced that anybody who gets like perfect YouTube picture videos of their children constantly is bribing them or like <laughs> doing something <laughs> insane because I can barely get a picture of my kids. So, I mean, yeah, I think the idea that we're like have gotten over that like perfect parenting expectation that we're going to do this perfectly, I think that that is an advantage to our parenting and something we kind of have to like get away from, I guess. Well, I was going to say, um, when you were talking about the modeling, how like that is, it's very important. I've definitely said to the boys on a regular basis, like, listen, I'm feeling a little frustrated or when you do this, when you're not listening, I'm really, really frustrated, but we do need to model to them how to deal with our emotions and how to move past and how to, you know, how as an adult you should handle yourself while still giving them grace to be children, like, but also letting them know at the same time, like, okay, I get it, you're upset, but it's not acceptable for you to express it in this fashion, like, you need to use words or you need to, you know, go take a minute to yourself, but when you were talking about, uh, you know, like the online parenting and stuff like that, we were having a conversation with some people the other day and I was like, you know what? Our generation of people really grew up watching sitcoms and nobody watching us. We were like the latchkey kids. There weren't really moms home because everybody was working. And most of us parent like TV. And I think that that has a, a large impact on the way that the kids are nowadays. Because on TV, you didn't really see anybody getting spanked or... You know, like they sat down and had like the Danny Tanner conversations yeah. at the end of the and it sitcom. Worked. On, it TV. Worked on TV. On <laughs> TV. That's what I mean. <laughs> well, yeah, it right. worked on so, TV. We were, you know, we were a little lied to. That <laughs> right, and I think you can rationalize with your six-year-old. Right, and I think people expected that, but not realizing that that's what we were doing. But one thing that you said, Jane, that John does is applying the biblical principles to parenting because I feel like that for us has made a huge difference in um, the way that we parent our kids. Like our kids are not perfect, um, but I can say that we've gotten really good feedback from people who babysat them or the teachers at their school. Um, but it's because we've tried to make that our base and foundation. Like, listen, you could do this this way or you may see your friends doing it like this, or your friends' parents may deal with them this way, but in our house, this is how we do it because we are trying to serve God and we want you to be godly men. And if you love God, you have to learn to love him more than you love you. Mm -hmm. And that means sometimes telling yourself, no, I'm not gonna lie, or no, I'm not gonna do this. And a huge part of that is obedience because you have to learn how to be obedient to your parents so that you can learn to be obedient to him as well. Right. People of the book. That's not always an easy thing. You know what I mean? Like it's not easy always to discipline your kids and it is hard, especially as a mom to see them upset or to hear them crying about something. But, um, you know, back to the spinning it back around to the cultural part of it. I do think that, um, some of that harsh discipline or that uh, the more stern, strict parenting that comes from cultures of color stems from a lot of, uh, I know for Black people in particular, like from slavery and stuff like that, you had to teach your kids, like it could cost your whole entire family their life if your kid was mouthy or disobedient and didn't listen. Mm -hmm. You know, and so that kind of strict parenting is always like, you do what I said the first time, or you come the first time I call you, 
you don't get a say so in anything shut up and don't say a word or you know like that kind of stuff because it was life-threatening all the way really up until what the 70s maybe mm-hmm. and even really still today say, even but, today in some i mean thankfully yeah. not yeah. across the board but definitely it still happens and right. uh, one of the sayings we had in our house was when I say jump, you say how high. Like, you don't mm-hmm. question, like, why I told you to do this. Like, when I say jump, you say how high. Like, that's it. It's not, you know, up for the debate. But I was also the youngest, and I feel like they got tired of parenting by the time they got to me. So. That usually happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but, yeah, I think there was, like, that safety aspect. I know that my brother, so my family w- that I grew up in was, two white siblings, me, you know, being fairly pale. And uh, then my brother who was black. And so I think that a lot of the times he was treated differently, but I think that some of it was out of fear um, and not, not because there was any, you know, they didn't see him as anything different than, you know, their son. They didn't love him any differently. But I think there was definitely that level of fear that, you know, yeah, your friends might do this, but if you're with people who are doing something wrong, even if you're not doing it, you're going to be questioned first. You're mm-hmm. going to be, the blame's going to end up on you. Um, I even had a situation where <laughs> I had a friend's parent say that she couldn't hang out with me because they were afraid that I was a bad influence and their kid was the one who was drinking all the time. And it was just like the perceived idea and never mind that their parents were in recovery. um, It was, they got the idea from me, even though they Mm -hmm. hadn't. I was like, you know, it might be that your parents are, you know, recovering, but uh, sure it was me because, you know, clearly I was the one that would be the bad influence, you know? um, And some of that came from, you know, that perspective, my mom, my mom that adopted me, grew up, she was born in 1950, and when she was brought up, being adopted was, like, a bad thing. It was, like, a stigma. Even though it was within her own family, it was this idea that if you were adopted, you came from bad, bad genes, you know, like, there was something wrong with you. So, Mm -hmm. like, that was how she had been perceived, though her family was, like, no, that's not how it is. But I think some of that color, that some of that stigma still existed when I was a kid. The idea that, you know, just by association, you're automatically bad. So there was that idea of, and then being the few kids of color in an area, the idea that you have to go above and beyond to fight all of the stereotypes. <laughs> like, yes. You can't just be, a, you know, you can't do anything wrong because then mm-hmm. you fit into that stereotype or that statistic even though lots of kids do stupid stuff because they're kids yeah yeah well while i think that this is a <laughs> two or three parter <laughs> i do think there's so much on this topic that needs to be discussed and that can be discussed you know um just one from culture two the difference between male parenting and female parenting how we how we Definitely. as males respond to parenting and discipline child rearing compared to how mothers uh, view uh, child rearing and how the two should and could balance out and we have the spiritual aspect of it because um, there surely is a spiritual aspect of it um, John you made a point about um, the children being a reflection of the parent, and I am one who believes that. Um, I can't vouch or speak on behalf of some other kid out there, but when people see my children, if you if the children are acting up, you know what they say? They question the parents. They always question the parent because children, um, it's our duty to, no one knows they don't come out the womb knowing respect. They don't come out the womb knowing good manners and good character. Mm-hmm. Those are, those are, that's learned behavior. Somebody's got to teach them. And we can't look and have an expectation that the teachers will teach them good character, good manners and stuff like that. It's our, it's our job and our duty. Remind me to come back. And, um, and so it's like, and even scripturally speaking, it's our duty. There were people who, you know, in, in scripture, their children were running amok and it hurt them. 
he heard them and these were people that knew God. So um, I do believe and uh, when it comes to um, the, uh, the reflection, maybe us as men have a different viewpoint on that compared to mothers. And then also when I said about culture, like there are some cultures that may be tough on their children. I know places in Africa, um, like I, I, ironically, I wound up, you know, in places that I work, <laughs> I've met a lot of people from, uh, from um, Nigeria. Nigeria, yeah. And so these guys are telling me, you know, about life back there in Nigeria and their parents and blah, blah, blah. And uh, I guess scientists and stuff like that think that Nigerians had a special type of gene. <laughs> and the one guy says, he says, Sharif, listen, there is no special gene. He said, our parents just tear us up if we act enough. They don't, they don't settle, they don't settle for them having B's and C's. The expectation is A, A, A. And if they don't get the A, they might give them a pop. And, uh, and so their discipline provokes them to reach far and beyond. And me and uh, Camille often have a conversation about it. Sometimes, you know, which one is more beneficial? And I know, again, there's so much that we could talk about. There's a lot of uh, spiritual aspect involved. And I also know that there's a lot of people who call on different gods. But the difference with our God is his whole thing is run by love. So that, that's, the, that's, the, that's the foundation with him, uh, the foundation of love. And so all your discipline is, is building on the foundation of love with us. People on, that, that believe in other things, I, don't, I can't speak for what their foundation is. Now, with that, with that being said, um, there have, we've, me and Camille have had the conversation about some parents being really strict on their children and really keying in and focusing on their getting grades, schoolwork, and you gotta be this, you gotta be that. On the one end, when your child is like, I don't wanna be a doctor. I wanna grow up and be a, a piano a piano player. I don't wanna be some doctor or something like that. But on the one end, one might cry and argue this, the fact that I didn't wanna be this. But mm -hmm. then on the other end of the spectrum, when you become an adult and now you're able to afford this $800,000 house, driving this nice luxury car, and you're able to take your family on vacations and stuff like that, then one has to wonder. Your parents, they have already reached it. The, they've gone from childhood to adulthood, and they know what it's like to go through having to worry about paying bills, worry about paying mortgage, worry about taking vacation and have the finer things of life for your children. Mm -hmm. So it's such a it's a, it's a it's a it's a tough balance, and it's one that, that's why I said this could be a two three parter right here. <laughs> well, talking about that though, so I know that when I was growing up, I have always loved babies and always loved kids my whole entire life. And so what I wanted to do initially was to be a social worker, and my mom was like, "You don't need to do that. They don't make enough money." And da 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 da. -da. And she was like, you need to be a teacher. And so that's what I ended up going to school for. And then I ended up dropping out because I hate teaching. I don't like teaching. I don't like having to manage a whole 30, you know, classroom full of 30 kids. Um, I went back and still, you know, picked it up again. I worked in a classroom in the school district, but it wasn't my, my pull was more towards uh, the children who needed that special support. So I was a, an emotional support counselor which is still like a part of social work and i'm like this is what i felt like i should be doing mm -hmm. now thankfully i've thanks to silver i found doula work which encompasses just all encompassing for the things that i love um but it's like sometimes you do need to give your kids space to find who they are and i think that that's a difference from generations past till now where it was always you do what i say you don't have a voice you don't know anything as opposed to encouraging the gifts that and the, the talents and the passions that your children have and recognizing that although they are children, they are still people. And mm -hmm. I, I feel like a lot of times, um, you know, another friend and I were having a discussion a couple of years ago and we were talking about how um, typically in white culture, the children are, their confidence is built very early on, like, you know, 
great job, buddy. And, you know, they're very supportive and not so harsh. And although the kids are allowed to, well, from our perspective, we're allowed to do a whole lot more than we would have been allowed to do. Like, man, if I said that to my mom, I would have got smacked. Or, <laughs> you know, if I tried that, I would have got a whooping. But, you know, it's like, but then you look at the, look at them as adults. And it's like, they have the confidence to advocate for themselves. Mm. They have the confidence to, to take risks because they're not afraid of messing up because they didn't have a parent that, you know, chastised them for messing up one time. They had the parent that said, it's okay, dust yourself off and get back up and try again. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that harsh discipline, although sometimes it's necessary, sometimes they can backfire because then it kills the confidence in the kid. And then, you know, they won't even attempt to try something because of the fear of failure. They won't mm -hmm. attempt to advocate for themselves because now they have this curated fear of authority. So anytime someone that they see as an authority figure, they're, they're afraid to say, hey, it's not okay for you to talk to me that way. Or, hey, it's not okay for you to treat me this way or to advocate for a raise or whatever. And I think that that kind of can, in some cases, can hold people back. Um, and people don't realize, like, I feel like there's a, a happy medium somewhere you know it doesn't have to necessarily be all of one or all of the other and one thing that I try to do with the boys is like I said I've been working with kids for over 25 years so I take into consideration all of the different kids that I've encountered and all of the parenting styles that I've seen and try to pull from what I saw worked mm -hmm. I'm not saying I'm a perfect mom not by a long shot I lose my temper regularly um, there are days when I'm like, mm, I got to go in my room because I'm all touched out. I've had enough. But where's the rod? <laughs> you've like accumulated a good toolbox. <laughs> I hear you saying like you've got all your, you know, like tips and tricks that you've like picked up here and there, you know. <laughs> That's a huge benefit, you know, because like seeing, seeing, good and bad examples is, is like, you know, that's, it's prime learning opportunity, right? And, and seeing it spread out over a bunch of different families, a bunch of different dynamics. That's a, that's a real advantage. I think um, it's a great thing. I've seen John's family, like really nurture things, even in our own daughter, like they nurture, you know, they're always asking about her dance and her, and I'm like, that's her hobby. If she uh, wants Mass. to, go... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm, if she wants to grow up and be a dancer, that's cool. That can be what she her hobby is as a grown up. But that's not gonna necessarily pay the bills. Let's be honest. You know, like not everybody gets into that prima ball ballerina like position, and so we got we got to pay the bills. Is like what I always think too. But uh, John's parents are always nurturing that part of her, and like one and like no. But also, I feel like I have to, when we talk about coming from a biblical perspective, I have to kind of like calm what now I know is called the tiger mom in me. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, think about like, what is my motive? Like, do I, am I looking for my kid to grow up to be rich so that she can take care of me in retirement, which I think is the Chinese perspective? I'm like sitting here being like, why do the Chinese do that? Like, why do we, you know, I don't know. But but some of it really is like, you take care of the elderly, you take care of the family, you know, like the el the older people make sacrifices for the children. Yeah. Um, and then the children go and take care of the, the older people, you know, later on. Um, but I want to like check my motive and be like, do I not want her to be a ballerina because I want her to, you know, um, be rich one day or am I really looking for her to find out maybe me. get her to worship him with her day you know and like am I game for that? I game for what he has made her for not necessarily what I have already planned out for her to be because I may or may not have already written her college entrance essay you know <laughs> <laughs> but, so that, but that's the thing like I I am a believer in while we can have dreams of, about what we'd like to see for our children god has a path already set for them yeah and so who are we to tell them that because and not to say that she shouldn't you know find something that can pay the bills mm -hmm. but also 
why not be able to nurture that thing because she could be the next you know prima ballerina mm. right you know and it's like who, like so we have a son who is although he's very smart he is very much into music and dance and he has been that way since he could crawl he is he walks in the store and if music is on he's dancing in the store i have to threaten him all the time cut it out <laughs> but i told him i said let him just do it he's not hurting anybody Thanks. i don't really care what other people think if they are being kids like <laughs> I don't feel like you got to walk like a man when you're six. I feel like if you are feeling, uh, what was the song he was dancing to was Gloria Estefan and it was on the floor. <laughs> and he's in the store pop locking as we're walking and I got it on video. <laughs> because, you know, but I see that gifting in him in that music and I'm like, that's his talent and I don't want him to bury it out of fear of it not uh, creating more. You know what I mean? Because that's that's what's in him and so while i do you know push for him to do his best um because that's also a biblical principle we're supposed to do everything as we're as if we were doing it unto the lord so mm -hmm. yes you study yes you do your best in schoolwork but guess what i'm also going to nurture that part of you that enjoys that music because it's something that's in you and if it's there it's there for a reason now i yeah. will mm -hmm. say i will say that that is one thing that Music has been my life. Uh, he dances a lot, sings, everything. And that was me. I danced. I, as a kid, I was a really good dancer. Um, I sing. Um, I've played instruments. I played saxophone. I have a harp. Um, and uh, so, um, but that was something that, one, I was, I got concerned about image at a certain point. And it wasn't the cool thing after a while to be doing certain things. So it kind of fell off a lot. Um, I kept singing. That was one thing that wasn't really nurtured. So I, I was a, a shower singer. I didn't start singing out in public until I was almost in a matter of fact, I might've been like 18, 19 years old. Uh, matter of fact, even after that. Um, and I just think about how much better would my skills be you know, I am great, by the way, but, <laughs> but how, much, <laughs> how much better would my skills be um, if that was nurtured and, you know, uh, at a young age? So that is one thing that she, Camille actually brought up, and I was like, hmm, I, I had to take heed to it. She was absolutely right, because I'm telling him in the store, cut it out. <laughs> but, you know, she made a good point. Mm -hmm. I take uh, that that for me like i'm the black sheep of the family i don't think they would call me that but i always felt like that because i did become a teacher and and that was like not good enough you know i went to the state school i went you know and i was like i'm gonna do what makes me happy and this is what i believe god made me to do so now as i'm a mom i gotta remember that for you know my kids too this is kind of on the dance note and like the music note one of the things that so I actually really, really respect my dad because he is one of those people who can look back at his parenting and be like, wow, you know, I really could have done this or I could have done that. Like, he's been very good at like seeing that because again, we're all, we were all, we all wing it as parents. We're just doing the best that we can. So I really respected, you know, like his stance on things. But one of the things that he said is, so my brother is one of those, he's a natural athlete. Like mm -hmm. he could pick up a sport at any age any type of sport and excel like with kids like he could start in junior high sports that kids started when they were four and he would excel he was just a natural <laughs> athlete but he was he's like five six <laughs> so he was really really good at basketball and my dad actually says one of his regrets was um kind of deterring him from playing basketball a lot because of his height and then he's like when alan iverson came out he was like what have I done? <laughs> you know, right. just that idea because we get so stuck in, you know, what things should look like. And, you know, sometimes we almost, we can limit our kids sometimes, yes. you know, in like, in based on our own fears, mm -hmm. you know, and I mean, no, we can't say that he would have done something differently. Um, right. You know, so it's not that, but just as a parent, he was like, you know, maybe I could have killed something in him that, you know, really could have gone somewhere, even if it was just a confidence thing, you know, mm -hmm. and my, I remember I, I didn't, 
I wanted to be a model when I was little. I'm five, <laughs> barely five feet tall. But I did model for local print. And I remember one of the times, like, my mom, like, really kind of, like, deterring me from that. And I actually don't regret that. Like, I think it was smart. But, like, there was, you know, now that I'm older and where I'm at and everything like that. But there were years where I was, like, what could have happened? Obviously, I would not have gone front way because I'm two feet tall. Um, but, like, you know, like, the print at stuff like that. Like, I was super into that for years as a kid. And I put a lot into it. And then I remember being, like, resentful. Um, but as an adult, I see that was more God, God had me on a certain path. And I think God knows my personality enough to know that I'm not somebody who should have gone down that path. Um, and so I think there's that balance of trying to do our best as parents and then also realizing that God cares about our kids more than we do. So even if we make mistakes as parents, like he we're not strong enough to mess up his plan completely. Yeah. Like we don't have that much power. Right. Um, that doesn't take away our responsibilities. It doesn't take away that we should be nurturing and building and all of those things. But I think there's that, I don't want to say, I guess like comfort level and kind of knowing that God's, I mean, my life looks absolutely nothing like I would have planned. Um, I like I wouldn't, I didn't even know what a doula was. Um, and then, you know, here I am like years later, it's led to multiple different career options and like things that have worked perfectly for my family. Not that it's been easy, but it's definitely where I'm supposed to be at. And so even though um, I didn't take the path that I thought I would and I didn't take the path that my parents thought I would, um, I think things worked out how they needed to in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. you know, so. I have a question for you guys. What do you think, or how do you think parenting plays in the way society is today versus yesteryear? I mean, you look at today's children on a, on a broad scale, and, you know, a lot of people say the same thing. These children are so disrespectful and blah, blah, blah. It's like, where does the parenting come in today? compared to yesterday. Somebody mentioned it earlier about, you know, <laughs> you say certain things to your parents and it's out of line and you might get the hand. Um, so it's like, you know, for one, you know, it just makes me think about it a lot. Uh, you, you see, I don't know, even music, the, the music that comes out, um, the attitudes that people have these days, younger generation, it's like, is there a difference in parenting today compared to before, which is causing uh, such a negative impact in the in society? Um, I, I have think, a lot to say about that, so I'll let somebody else go first. Oh, please. Um, I think there's like a lot of factors to that. Um, I mean, I don't know any, any of this for sure, but I think you touched on one of them when you were like, we were raised by sitcoms, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so there's a difference of style, right, that we saw modeled. Um, there's, a lot of more, there's a lot more divorce, so there's a lot more single parent homes. Mm. Without like the balance of uh, a mother or father to, to like give different perspectives. Um, there's a lot of socioeconomics. And then I think there was like an actual movement in the, psycho like, the psychology community, mm -hmm. like in the 70s. To that really like it cut the knees out from under um, authoritative parenting and was and, and shifted it toward a toward a uh, a more child centered like approach where it was just like you're you're you solely exist to like like serve the child right mm -hmm. and 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 the wants of the child and the needs of the child and the dreams of the child the emotions and and, and just yeah. to be up and then discarded right like because and, and i mean that fits with certain worldviews right that that are very contrary to the scripture in some ways in the sense of the scripture is going to tell you you know gray hair is a, is, is a badge of honor it's going to tell you that you right. respect your elders about like first and foremost whereas like more of a i guess secular humanist progressive sort of mentality is going to say children of the future it's only getting better and better you know, right. uh, 
they're more evolved than we are, you know, like whatever, whatever you want to say, you, you know, there's going to be a couple different threads in there, but it's going to sound something like that. And so it's going to be like now, now Jimmy runs the show, right? It's, it's, yeah. it's, you know, now, now the kid is the boss and they run the household and they're allowed to openly manipulate situations with emotional outbursts and allowed to be disrespectful. Um, and it just plays itself out and people don't know how to, actually have that biblical authoritative like uh, view and, and leadership in their own households right. such that their kids can see what authority looks like and how God structures authority to, to make sure everybody's needs are met. Um, mm -hmm. I think like, it's like, I mean, I think, I don't know how to say it like, uh, right maybe, but I think like white culture and white progressive, like, um, thoughts and theories on, on psychology and, and development and education have really played into that a lot. Mm. And I think that okay. even with some of the more like affluent, like Caucasian sort of people, um, eventually the money gets used as the, as the hook, right? Because oh. I don't actually have just inherent authority, but I have the money, right? I got the money hook Good and you know, you're written out of the will. You're going to get your college oh. fund taken away. You're gonna get kicked out of your trust fund. Like the kid still grows up entitled. They grow up oh, good overconfident, point. right? Because they've never been smacked down by an actual authority and they don't have a proper respect for authority. So mm -hmm. everything's questionable, everything's debatable, everything's negotiable. Mm -hmm. Right. Not a good right. mentality. Right. But you know, that that money hook, right? I've got that. But then sure enough, when you start using that hook, then it, and I, I didn't struggle with any of this because I know I, I'm like, where's our trust fund? I, I didn't come from <laughs> from that, but my parents were very much in the way of you're going to do what I say and you're going to do it now, <laughs> and late obedience is disobedience, so you better get moving. And in um, kindergarten, right, right, right. you're going to pay for college because we're not going to pay for it. <laughs> right, well, we're too broke for that. Sorry, but you know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> everywhere, but um, you know. But there's this mentality that grows up, and then when you use money as a hook, and the, the kid sees that, they learn that money and power are the same thing, and that money and power are the only things worth anything because they get you control over other people. Interesting, right? That's a and it's just point. that's passed down. It's that's a real dangerous place to be, and I think there's a lot of people with a lot of power that think that way. Mm -hmm. Interesting point. <laughs> the psychology, even of. Um, like let's be in tune with our children's emotions now was you know like the moms who are in tune with emotions would be like no husband like we have to be in tune with our kids emotions and he's like emotions like i don't know what to do with that <laughs> i feel like dad, dad were put, like in the back burner you know with parenting and like the moms had to like um or maybe like the moms maybe like shove themselves to the front you know and we're like no i'll handle this i'm gonna do this and so the dads are like, well, I don't know where to be. And then, you know, we can sit here and complain, like, where are the dads? Like, where are the men? Like, disciplining the children. But they were kind of kicked out. We were told to sit in the corner and color. <laughs> That's a good point. That's a valid point. Yeah. Like, what are they supposed to do but then go sit and watch TV, you know? And then it just becomes, I don't know. Right. So now here goes my long-winded synopsis of why children are the way they are today. <laughs> Move your hand. So, I think a lot of it came from, uh, John, you made an excellent point about how uh, white Americanized psychology was kind of like the standard of, oh, no, 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 I'm going to write a book and tell you what you should do with your kids, when in reality, a lot of the people who were writing the books did not have children or children of the age that they were writing about. Mm -hmm. That's the first part. And I think too many people bought into that and it's the whole, I want to appear smart. So I'm going to tell you about all these books I read and use this to excuse my lack of parenting or the, the lackadaisical parenting style that I'm using because this book told me I should do it. There's that part of it. Then there's also uh, parents were not as present. Uh, prior generations, there was at least one parent in the home. So kids didn't get away with a whole lot more and there was more the village mentality of parenting so mm. if your neighbor saw you doing something they might smack you on the tush 
then come tell your parents and then you were going to get it again. And so you knew, mm, I better not do that because Miss Johnson down the street is going to come back and tell my mom or my <laughs> grandmother or my dad and I'm going to get it. Parents and teachers were allies as opposed to enemies mm. because if I had, uh, if I had, if my teacher had called home and said, hey, Camille was rude and disrespectful, my mother would not have cursed out the teacher and be like, that ain't my kid. And da, 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 da. she would have brought me to the school and would have talked to me and said, um, she would have talked to me and, well, she wouldn't have talked to me. She would have been like, go get that switch and we'll deal with that, you know, yada, yada, yada. So uh, there's that part of it. And it's like, there is a huge generation, like I would say from the early 90s, uh, generations of children who were taught you don't have to do what they said if you don't